Associate Professor Fatima Latif highlighted that the concept of productivity differs between sectors. Yes, it is true that different sectors measure productivity in ways that make most sense to them. This is why the National Productivity and Continuing Education Council adopted a sectoral approach towards driving productivity growth. Consulting closely with the respective trade associations and chambers, we developed customised productivity improvement roadmaps to tackle the different challenges that each sector faces. We also complement macro-level measurements with sector-specific indicators. Likewise, our public outreach effort is also tailored to a specific sector. Madam Chair, may I have your permission to show some slides on screens? Please. Thank you. For instance, under the Way to Go National Productivity Communications Campaign, we highlight stories of best practices in different industries. Many of you would have read some of the stories in Business Times and Lian He Zhao Bao in the year-long education and outreach campaign. Mr. Sam Tan and Mr. Zaki Muhammad asked about the progress of these productivity efforts. Year to year, headline productivity numbers fluctuate. In 2010, our productivity shot up by 11.1%. In 2012, it declined by 2.6%. Productivity measures are sensitive to economic cycles. A sharp drop in product prices can, for instance, mask the improvement made in labour productivity. In the long run, however, the value added per worker ought to rise reflecting rising productivity. The government remains therefore fully committed to helping our industries achieve long-term and sustainable productivity growth. Sector by sector, we are implementing customised productivity roadmaps systematically. In the retail industry, for instance, 200 retailers have undertaken productivity and services upgrading projects. 200 CEOs and productivity managers have participated in training, and 14,000 retail workers took classes at different levels offered by the Workforce Development Agency. Clearly, a lot more retailers and retail professionals can benefit from these programs, and we have the capacity to train them. Besides reaching out to more, Spring will also go deeper. It will introduce more in-depth projects designed to help integrate the supply chain and promote wider adoption of technology, such as integrated point-of-sale systems and inventory management systems. Embracing technology at the industry level will bring about larger quantum of productivity improvement. At the firm level, we also have committed $180 million in grants to about 10,000 companies. Among them, 90% were small and medium enterprises. Again, we have the capacity to fund more firm-level projects and we want more firms to step forward. At the national level, we have committed about $1 billion from the National Productivity Fund to support the many sectoral plans and horizontal programs. One new initiative we are introducing is the Collaborative Industry Projects, or in short, CIP. We will extend Collaborative Industry Projects to six more industry verticals led by Spring, including food services, retail, food manufacturing, furniture manufacturing, printing and packaging, and textile and fashion. The objective of these CIPs is to help achieve a step change in the productivity of a large group of companies by encouraging them to work together in areas that can bring them the benefits of integration and economies of scale. To give an example, SMEs in the F&B sector can reduce their manpower requirements by aggregating demand and collectively outsourcing their food preparation to suppliers. They could also pool logistic assets such as warehouses and delivery trucks to benefit from economies of scale. Hopefully, CIPs can also bring about greater integration in the supply chain and reduce wastage and inefficiency. 
CRPs could also potentially seed new players and modify industry structure in the longer term. We will commit $90 million for such projects over the next three years in the six sectors that by spring, and will roll out the first call for projects in the second half of this year. Everything being equal, rising sales of company will also raise productivity. This is important because many productivity discussions focus on labour productivity and omit revenue generation and value creation, just like Mr Indrajit Singh has highlighted. Internationalisation is very crucial in raising a company's productivity. Singapore firms need to look beyond our small domestic market and tap into new regional demands. The Bread Talk Group started as a one-shop company in year 2000. 2000. Today, the group has over 700 outlets under eight brands in 15 countries. Bread Talk has tackled productivity challenge from all angles. It has creatively differentiated itself through product innovation and has continually revamped its business model. It has evolved from a one shop to many chains, one brand to eight brands, in-shop baking to central kitchen, and a local company to a regional player. These efforts have helped BreadTalk to grow its revenues and profits. By expanding boldly into new overseas market, BreadTalk has enhanced its competitiveness and enjoyed economies of scale. BreadTalk now has more resources to invest in technology and do product development. It enjoys strong brand recognition internationally. Soon, BreadTalk will open its new international headquarters building at Pa Leba. <coughs> By then, it will create more skilled and high-paying jobs for Singaporeans in areas such as regional HQ management, product development, training and logistics, and so on. From the above examples, it is clear that at some point, our SMEs must transcend our small domestic market to realise their next stage of growth. Singapore is fortunate in that we are at the centre of growth in Asia, just as Minister Lim has highlighted earlier. China has a rising middle class of 300 million, and while India has 160 million. Consumer demand is also growing in ASEAN economies with their useful demographics. Our SMEs are indeed well placed to take advantage of these opportunities at our doorstep. Further away are emerging markets such as those in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Russia, Central and South Asia, offering some niche opportunities for our export business. Though less well known, Singapore businesses are already trading with or investing in some of these economies. With the right strategy, our firms will find niche opportunities in these markets. Uh, Ms. Jessica, Mr. Tio Song Singh, uh, Mr. Indrajit Singh will be glad to know that in 2012, IE Singapore assisted over 15,000 companies in their internationalization drive and supported 6,000 companies through its incentive programs. IE also launched the Global Company Partnership, GCP, to help companies internationalize by providing support along four key areas that is, capability building, manpower development, market access, and financing. To help SMEs accelerate their pace of internationalization, IE Singapore is launching an $18 million market readiness assistance program, MRA. MRA can be applied to individual company or trade associations. For individual companies, IE will co-fund up to 50% of the eligible costs associated with foreign market assessment and market entry, including legal service, legal advice, tax advisory, and consultancy services, up to a maximum of 20,000 per company per year. I Singapore will launch this program on 1st April and expects to benefit up to 1,000 companies. For trade associations and chambers, IE will co-fund the cost of hiring in-market agents to seek out overseas business opportunities for the association members. In addition, IE will continue to organize eye advisory seminars and clinics 
for companies seeking new markets or overseas growth. These seminars will cover topics such as issues related to tax regulations, restructuring and relocation. Mr. Sam Tan asked how the government can help internationalizing companies cope with manpower constraints. Under the Global Company Partnership, or GCP program, IE will be setting aside 20 million to help business address three critical manpower challenges, attracting talent, developing talent, and establishing an international manpower strategy. Under the program, IE will provide more overseas training opportunities and scholarships for local undergraduates to prepare them for international careers, match young talents to internationalizing companies, and help key companies' executives acquire international HR expertise. Hopefully, our firms will learn to recruit, develop, and retain talents suited for regional and cross-cultural operations. Madam Chair, companies can raise productivity in many ways. Fundamentally, they have to find ways to raise revenues and reduce costs. Mr. Zaki Muhammad warned against productivity and propertivity. We agree that in the long term, these are not viable strategies. By putting off much needed productivity improvements, companies will eventually face a crunch again. Rising productivity is the only means to achieve sustainable growth. We discussed some examples of successful SMEs doing so. Their experiences show that it requires commitment and great efforts, but it is possible. Many SMEs have told me that they understand the need to change and restructure. The question now is not why and what, but how. So, as we endeavour to create the most conducive support system for change, let us work together on the house by gleaning best practices from other industries and markets, by brainstorming individually and collectively. I believe we can do it. In fact, we must succeed in order to arrive at the next phase of quality growth. Thank you.